this off. Okay, good afternoon. How's the, the volume on this? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I see some familiar faces in the audience here. I know there were some people here that took part in the response, so good to see some of you all again. Um, I will try and move quickly through the slides so we can allow a few minutes for questions if anybody has any questions about local perspective. Um, Bond did a great job of covering uh, the basics. I'll try not to do uh, that too much, except to reiterate that Santa Barbara County, uh, by uh, many accounts, is the birthplace of the modern environmental movement. Uh, but if you have to choose a place uh, in the country, there's no good place for an oil spill, but if you have to choose a particularly challenging place to have one, Santa Barbara County certainly qualifies. <laughs> uh, here's a map of our uh, energy map for, uh, for Santa Barbara County. So we are an energy rich county with a lot of infrastructure there. But for a lot of people, I think that live and reside and work there or whatever, it's not plainly apparent on a day to day basis. Uh, I won't uh, throw in too many photographs, but when you start talking about impact, uh, a lot of it comes down to the visual impact for, for, for uh, casual citizens' involvement. It really boils down to images that really kind of quantify the impact, right? And so they don't care how many barrels or gallons, but they care about seeing a photograph like that, right? That is the reality, ultimately, that becomes your reality, and that's the reality that we dealt with. So a couple more photographs here. This is a thickly famous photograph here. And I actually uh, met this gentleman uh, uh, then some months later at, at, a, uh, at a community meeting or whatever. So he was wearing a shirt at the time, but he is a, you know, a, a, a normal citizen. But this is what oil spills do to people. And so this really became kind of the face of, of, of the incident in many respects within, within the county. Okay, so as far as some of the county level response operations and assets, uh, county fire was part of the initial response. Um, they coincidentally happened to be out in that immediate area doing conducting an exercise at the time when the first call came in. Um, OEM staff were out there with them to participate in that exercise. Uh, public health responded uh, also to help assess the initial threat to public health. Um, and Office of Emergency Management was uh, a part of the, uh, as you mentioned before, is the local on scene coordinator as part of the unified command, thanks to our MOU with the state. Uh, uh, Edmund flowed that local personnel were integrated into the SCAT teams, either as observers uh, or, uh, or more officially part of it later on. And, uh, but the majority of the response assets were uh, state, federal, and contracted by the ARC, right? So that's, a, that's one of the fundamental differences between a traditional disaster response and an oil spill, right? So if it's a fire or flood, it's generally local resources that are the predominant response initially. Local government resources, I should say. Um, additional uh, local involvement, um, uh, county fire and general services did a great job of, of, of helping with the logistical support for the response. The first 13 days being in our EOC, um, County OM, uh, County OM, as I mentioned before, was part of the, the local lensing coordinator. Um, County Finance helped uh, for, uh, uh, to determine cost, and there was a lot of executive support and involvement uh, from the county, including our local elected officials. And then we also had county participation in the Joint Information Center as well. Um, one of the key differences, though, is the fundamental difference of an ICP versus an EOC. So uh, for those of you that, that you know, are, are part of this industry, it's plainly self-evident, but for those that aren't, an ICP is generally what manages the field response out there in the field, and it may be in a tent or out literally in the middle of the field or in the back, uh, you know, back uh, tailgate of a pickup truck. Uh, and then the EOC generally supports that from the county's emergency operations center and supports that response. We had both of those concurrently operating within the same physical facility, two fundamentally different um, functions, um, but uh, trying to uh, do both of those within the same building. We'll show a little bit more of the facility here. Um, the ICP was housed in the county EOC for 13 days. Uh, for those uh, of us that were there and lived it, uh, you know, time moves at a different pace, and it sure seemed uh, like more than that first day seemed like more than a day. 13 days seemed like more than 13 days. Um, I, I counted and went through and did a quick uh, 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 guesstimation from our sign-in sheets, and it came up with we came up with 62 different uh, government agencies and 600 people that worked in the ICP with or within the EOC. Uh, 54 contractors and, and 500 of their personnel, and 150 signatures I just couldn't decipher. <laughs> <laughs> but up to about 325 per day. Um, so this is the county's emergency operations seen from afar, from outside. You can see it was overflow for parking and personnel. Certainly the busiest and fullest that building ever been. Let's see a couple other photographs here. You can see uh, every square space, a bit of square space was used, so there's an cost for uh, a trailer there in the back, and there were other trailers. Literally within the building, though, we were literally using closets as meeting spaces. There were there were many little meetings and some closets there. Uh, here's one photograph of it, which really doesn't seem to express or uh, to display how, how busy and crowded it was. 
Uh, here's a, a, a photo of our MOU. So within Santa Barbara County, we're very, and one of the key findings in our draft report is that we're really uh, lucky and uh, uh, beneficial that we have this MOU with the state, which, which uh, mandates that we're part of the unified command. There are other things that we need to change, but this is one of the things that we, you know, we may choose to talk, discuss changing your clarification of language, but um, this is definitely one of, the, one of the wins and the lessons learned column. Um, you know, one of the other uh, challenges was mentioned before was um, just conveying to the public uh, the, the structure of the Unified Command. So the federal line scene coordinator, the state, local in our instance, and also the president of the responsible party. And that's just one of those deals where uh, we can pre-educate as much as we want, but when something happens, uh, the general public is not going to know that or understand that or, or, you know, and it takes a lot of explaining. I can't tell you how many different times I emailed out uh, the Code of Federal Regulations saying, look, this is not something we made up on the fly. This is part of the pre-existing regulation plans. And, and um, it, it's just part of, part of the inherent challenge. Um, Dr. Trading, this is our, uh, our uh, uh, org chart here. So you can see that uh, um, specific to this event, this is uh, one of the org charts from our, from our IAPs. And so it has the, um, our, our, both of our federal uh, unseen coordinators as well as state and then the ERP. Uh, this is a photograph from uh, May 19th out there. Yeah, I think that's you, John. <laughs> um, so you can see, but there are members from all the different elements there. So we have reps from the Coast Guard, we have reps from Osper and Fish and Wildlife, the County Emergency Management, the RP, and the County Fire Department over there on the right hand side as well. So it's a really good uh, display about that. It's, it demonstrates that transition from the initial response by County Fire to the transition over to Unified Command members that make up that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great system, but that's also one of the areas where we can probably further identify exactly when and how we transition the steps that need to, that need to be part of that transition in order to be timely and effective. Challenges. Um, well, so for the local and our end, speaking for myself, I can tell you one of our challenges is that um, we represent, we don't represent just one agency. I don't, you know, I didn't just represent the University of the Office of Emergency Management during that. Um, by virtue of SEMS and by virtue of our MOU, it was also our responsibility to represent all the, the entire county family, so all the county departments, uh, and, and to, to do that on the fly, it, that alone is pretty challenging, but then also representing all of our jurisdictions and districts, which we're required to do by law under SEMS, and then also our citizens, including, uh, including our NGOs, and that's a lot. So I can tell you that um, one person, you know, I, I don't think just the personal limitation, but one person just can't do that effectively, right? It, it just, too narrow of a, 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 a channel and too much, too much trying to shut too much into that bandwidth to do that. And so, you know, part of the solution is we need to then figure out better ways to pre-training, pre pre-identification, pre-clarification, uh, and incorporation um, as a, a appropriate incorporation of local expertise in the response to try and increase that bandwidth. Uh, by virtue of, of, of the nature of the beast is that, you know, Unified Command and the response is focused on the response and cleaning up the beach and stopping the oil from hitting the beach and cleaning it up. That's the mission, right? Um, but when you're representing the local interest, then the interests go beyond that, right? And so, and that's everything from historical to cultural interest. And so we also need to address those, those interests as well. Um, you know, and I can say this firsthand, being part of uh, UC, your, fo your, your focus is on cleaning up the oil, but um, you've also got to take a step back and take a look at those other external interests as well. Um, or P being part of Unified Command, that's just something that, um, you know, the public is just not used to seeing. And so the phrase you kept hearing was, you know, when there's a fire response, you don't see, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's an arsonist or PG&E or SCE or whatever it is, they cause the fire, they're not part of the, of the response, right? So the citizens aren't used to seeing that. Your local elected officials aren't used to seeing that. So I can't really uh, overstate uh, the, the importance of that and the challenges that come with that. Natural seats. Um, some people recognize it, some people don't. The fact of the matter is that Santa Barbara is a very natural, uh, an area that's very rich for natural sea. And so one of the challenges for us within UC was that every single day, and it seemed like more than once in a day sometimes, that we would get, um, you know, and I'm talking weeks and months into the response, that we would get additional notifications of, of oil on a beach or sheens, and we would go and scramble and send resources, resources out there. Coast Guard and State were great about going out on scene to identify. Uh, and, and, you know, and certainly in the early days of weeks, just cleaning it and dealing with it with regards to whether it was 901 oil or not. But at a certain point, you've got to make that distinction of whether something is natural safe or whether it's part of, you know, the spill. And uh, that's a challenge, certainly, and it may not be in other parts of the uh, country as much, but in Santa Barbara County, it certainly is. Uh, cultural, historical, and safety uh, challenges and constraints as well. So some of those have already been addressed or will be addressed, um, but they are real, they are substantial. I'll, I'll let uh, people 
um, refer to those um, more significantly. I will mention two things on historical and safety. Um, one of the challenges we had was there was a seawall out there. And uh, so one of the initial uh, reports back to UC was, well, you can't clean that. I mean, it's a huge, massive concrete seawall. And this is kind of out in the middle of one of the pocket beaches. And, and, and our, you know, we were informed that by the historic response, well, you can't clean that. And because it was more than 50 years old. And so it was one of those issues we had to work through and identify ways to clean without causing any damage to it. Uh, but just you know, politically speaking, it was just not going to be tenable to say we can't clean that concrete seawall because it's more than 50 years old. There's nothing. George Washington wasn't born there. Nobody slept the night there. There was no idea. That he said, was there any w, a WPA insignia on it? No. And it was just so it wasn't going to fly. Right. So we had to work through those challenges. Safety, same deal. We had uh, geologists and safety officer. You know, there was one day that said, you know, you can't, you can't have personnel within 25 feet of the, of the cliff face because it's, it's a risk, it's a safety, it's a safety hazard. Um, and so we got a second opinion from a different geologist who said you can't go within 50 feet of it. And so the challenge was that's a state park that every other day of the year, um, toddlers are planning on and they can go up and claim these cliff faces. And so how do you explain to the public saying, well, we can't clean those cliff faces? Um, we know that 